Percy Jackson and the Olympians, book one, The Lightning Thief, chapter one. I accidentally vaporized my pre-algebra teacher. Look, I didn't want to be a half-blood. If you're reading this because you think you might be one, my advice is this. Close this book right now. Believe whatever lie your mom or dad told you about your birth and just try to lead a normal life. Being a half-blood is dangerous. It's scary. Most of the time it gets you pilled in pain, killed in painful, nasty ways. If you're a normal kid, reading this because you think it's fiction, well, great. Read on. I envy you for being able to believe that none of this actually ever happened. But if you recognize yourself in these pages, if you feel something stirring inside, stop reading immediately. You might be one of us. And once you know that, it's only a matter of time before they sense it too. And they'll come for you. So don't say I didn't warn you. My name is Percy Jackson. I'm 12 years old. Until a few months ago, I was a boarding student at Yancey Academy, a private school for troubled kids in upstate New York. So am I a troubled kid? Yeah, you could say that. I could start at any point in my short, miserable life to prove it. But things really started going bad last May when our sixth grade class took a field trip to Manhattan. 28 mental case kids and two teachers on a yellow school bus heading to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to look at ancient Greek and Roman stuff. I know, it sounds like torture. Most of our field trips were. But Mr. Bruner, our Latin teacher, was leading this one, so I had hope. See, Mr. Bruner was this middle-aged guy in a motorized wheelchair. He had thinning hair and a scruffy beard, and a frayed tweed jacket, which always smelled like coffee. You wouldn't think he'd be cool, but he told stories and jokes and let us play games in class. He also had this awesome collection of Roman armor and weapons, so he was the only teacher whose class didn't put me to sleep. I hoped the trip would be okay. At least, I hoped that for once I wouldn't get in trouble. Oh boy, was I wrong. You see, bad things happen to me on field trips. Like at my fifth grade school, when we went to the Saratoga battlefield, I had this accident with a Revolutionary War cannon. Okay, I wasn't aiming for the school bus, but of course I got expelled anyway. And before that, at my fourth grade school, when we took a behind-the-scenes tour of the Marine World Shark Pool, I sort of hit the wrong lever on the catwalk, and our class took an unplanned swim in the shark tank. And then there was the time before that, well, you get the idea. So this trip, I was determined to be good. All the way into the city, I put up with Nancy Boba Fett, the freckly, red-headed, kleptomaniac girl hitting my best friend Grover in the back of the head with chunks of peanut butter and ketchup sandwich. Grover was an easy target. He was scrawny. He cried when he got frustrated. He must have been held back several grades because he was the only sixth grader with acne and the start of a wispy beard on his chin. On top of all that, he was crippled. He had a note excusing him from P.E. for the rest of his life because he had some kind of muscular disease in his legs. He walked funny, like every step hurt him. But don't let that fool you. You could have seen him run when it was enchilada day in the cafeteria. That boy could move. Anyway, Nancy Boba Fett was throwing wads of sandwich that stuck in his curly brown hair and she knew I couldn't do anything back to her because I was already on probation. The headmaster had threatened me with death by insul school suspension if anything bad, embarrassing, or even anything mildly entertaining happened on this trip. I'm going to kill her, 
I mumbled. Grover tried to calm me down. Hey, it's okay. I like peanut butter. He dodged another piece of Nancy's sandwich. That's it. I started to get up, but Grover pulled me back to my seat. You're already on probation, he reminded me. You know who'll get blamed if anything happens. Looking back on it, I wish I'd decked Nancy Boba Fett right then and there. In-school suspension would have been nothing compared to the mess I was about to get myself into. Mr. Bruner led the museum tour. He rode up front in his wheelchair, guiding us through the big echoey galleries, past marble statues and glass cases full of really old black and orange pottery. It blew my mind that this stuff had survived for 2,000, 3,000 years. He gathered us around a 13-foot-tall stone column with a big sphinx on the top and started telling us that he was how it was a grave marker, a stella for a girl about our age. He told us about the carvings on the side. I was trying to listen to what he had to say because it was actually kind of interesting, but everybody around me was talking, and every time I told them to shut up, the other teacher chaperone, Mrs. Dodds, would give me the evil eye. Miss Dodds was this little math teacher from Georgia who always wore a thick, a black leather jacket, even though she was like 50 years old. She looked mean enough to ride a Harley right into your locker. She had come to Nancy Yancey Academy halfway through the year when our last math teacher had a nervous breakdown. From her first day, Mrs. Dodds loved Nancy Boba Fett and figured I was the devil spawn. She would point her crooked finger at me and say, Now, honey, real sweet. And I knew I was going to get after school detention for a month. One time, after she had made me erase answers out of an old math workbook until midnight, I told Grover I didn't think Mrs. Dodds was human. He looked at me real seriously and said, You're absolutely right. Mr. Bruner kept talking about the Greek funeral art. Finally, Nancy Boba Fett snickered something about what the naked guy on the Stella, and I turned around and said, Will you shut up? And of course it came out louder than I meant it to. The whole group laughed. Mr. Bruner even stopped in the middle of his story. Mr. Jackson, he said, uh, did you have a comment? My face was totally red. I said, no, sir. Mr. Bruner pointed to one of the pictures on the Stella. Perhaps you'll tell us what this picture represents. I looked at the carving and I felt a flush of relief because I actually recognized it. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Yes, Mr. Bruner said. Obviously not satisfied, though. And Kronos ate his kids, why? Uh, well, I racked my brain to remember. So Kronos was like the king god, and god? Mr. Bruner asked. Uh, Titan. I corrected myself. And... So he didn't tr trust his kids who were the gods. So um, Kronos ate them, right? But his wife hid baby Zeus and gave Kronos a rock to eat instead. And then later, when Zeus grew up, he tricked his dad, Kronos, into barfing up his brothers and sisters. Ew, said one of the girls behind me. And anyway, so there was this big fight between the gods and the titans, I continued, and the gods won. There was some laughs and snickers from the group. Behind me, Nancy Boba Fett mumbled to a friend, Yeah, like we're ever going to use this in real life. Like it's going to say on a job application, uh, Please explain why Kronos ate his kids. And why, Mr. Jackson, Bruner said, 
To paraphrase Mrs. Bulbafit's excellent question, why does this matter in real life? Oh, busted, Grover muttered. Shut up, Nancy hissed, her face even brighter red than her hair. Well, at least Nancy got in trouble, too. Mr. Bruner was the only one who ever caught her saying anything wrong. She had radar ears. I thought about his question, and I shrugged. I don't know, sir. I see. Mr. Bruner looked disappointed. Well, half credit, Mr. Jackson. Zeus did indeed feed Kronos a mixture of mustard and wine, which made him disgorge his other five children, who, of course, being immortal gods, had been living and growing up completely undigested in the Titan's stomach. The gods defeated their father, sliced him to pieces with his own scythe, and scattered his remains in Tartarus, the darkest part of the underworld. On that happy note, hey, it's time for lunch! Mrs. Dodds, will you lead us all back, side, back outside? The class drifted off, the girls holding their stomachs, the guys pushing each other around and acting like morons. Grover and I were about to follow them when Mr. Bruner said, Mr. Jackson, I knew, I knew what was, I knew that was coming. I told Grover to keep going. Then I turned toward Mr. Bruner. Yes, sir. Mr. Bruner had this look that wouldn't let you go. Intense brown eyes that could have been a thousand years old and had seen everything. You must learn to answer my question, Mr. Bruner told me. You mean about the Titans? About real life and how your studies apply to real life. Oh. What you learned from me, he said, is vitally important. I expect you to treat it as such. I will only accept the very best from you, Percy Jackson. I wanted to get angry. Man, this guy always pushed me so hard. I mean, sure... It was kind of cool on tor on tournament days when he got dressed up in, in a suit of Roman armor and shouted, What ho! And he would like challenge us and, you know, sword point against chalk to run up to the board and name every Greek and Roman person who had ever lived, you know what I mean, like in their mother and what god they worshipped. And we would all have to race and write it down. But Mr. Bruner expected me to be as good as everybody else despite the fact that I have dyslexia and attention deficit disorder and I had never made above a C- in my life. No. No, he didn't just expect me to be as good. He literally expected me to be better. And I just couldn't learn all those names and facts, much less spell them correctly. I mumbled something about trying harder, while well, Mr. Bruner took one long, sad look at the Stella like he'd been at this girl's funeral. He told me to go outside and eat my lunch. The class gathered on the front steps of the museum where we could watch the foot traffic along 5th Avenue. Overhead, a huge storm was brewing with clouds blacker than I'd ever seen over the city. I figured maybe it was global warming or something, because the weather all across New York State had been really weird since Christmas. We'd had massive snowstorms, flooding, wildfires from lightning strikes. I wouldn't have been surprised if this was a hurricane coming in. Nobody else seemed to even notice. Some of the guys were pelting pigeons with Lunchables crackers. Nancy Bobafit was trying to pickpocket something from a lady's purse, and, of course, Mrs. Dodds wasn't seeing a thing. Grover and I sat on the edge of the fountain, away from the others. We thought that maybe if we did that, everybody wouldn't know we were from that school. You know, the school for loser freaks who couldn't make it elsewhere. 
Detention? Grover asked. Nah, I said, not from Bruner. I just wish he'd lay off me sometimes. I mean, I'm not a genius. Grover didn't say anything for a while. Then, when I thought he was going to give me like some deep philosophical comment to make me feel better, he said, Dude, can I have your apple? I didn't have much of an appetite, so I let him take it. I watched the stream of cabs going down Fifth Avenue and thought about my mom's apartment, only a little ways uptown from where we sat right then. I hadn't seen her since Christmas. I wanted so bad to jump in one of those taxis and head home. Oh, she'd hug me and be glad to see me, but she'd be disappointed too. She'd send me right back to Nancy, to Yancey School. She'd remind me that I had to try harder. Even if this was my sixth school in six years, and I was probably going to get kicked out of this one too, I wouldn't be able to stand the sad look she would give me. Mr. Bruner parked his wheelchair at the base of the handicapped ramp. He ate celery while he read a paperback novel. A red umbrella stuck up from the back of his chair, making it look like a motorized cafe table. I was about to unwrap my sandwich when Nancy Boba Fett suddenly appeared in front of me with her ugly friends. I guess she'd probably gotten tired of stealing from tourists, and she dumped her half-eaten lunch right in Grover's lap. Oops, she grinned. With her crooked teeth. Her freckles were orange, as if someone had spray painted her face with liquid Cheetos. I tried to stay cool. The school counselor had told me like a million times count to ten, get control of your temper. But I was so mind that my mind I was so mad my mind went blank. A wave roared in my ears. I don't remember touching her, but the next thing I knew, Nancy was sitting on her butt in the fountain, screaming, Percy pushed me! Percy pushed me! And Ms. Mrs. Dodds showed up right next to us. Some of the kids were whispering, Did you see th the water? Like, like it grabbed her. I didn't know what they were talking about. All I knew was I was in trouble. Again. As soon as Mrs. Dodds was sure that poor little Nancy was okay, promising to get her a new shirt at the museum gift shop, etc., etc., Mrs. Dodds turned on me. There was a triumphant fire in her eyes as if I'd finally done something she'd been waiting for all semester. Now, honey, I know, I grumbled. I get to erase math workbooks for a month now, probably. Okay, so that wasn't the right thing to say. <laughs> Come with me, Mrs. Dodge said. Mrs. Dodge said. Wait, Grover yelped. Hey, it was me. I was the one that pushed her. I stared at him, stunned. I couldn't believe he was trying to cover for me. Mrs. Dodd scared Grover to death. She glared at him so hard his whiskery chin trembled. I don't think so, Mr. Underwood, she said. But you will stay here. Grover looked at me desperately. It's okay, man, I told him. Hey, thanks for trying. Honey, Mrs. Dogs barked at me. Now. Nancy Boba Fett smirked. I gave her my deluxe... I'll kill you later, stare. 
Then I turned to face Mrs. Dodds, but she wasn't there. She was standing at the museum entrance, way at the top of the steps, gesturing impatiently for me to come on. How did she get up there so fast? I have moments like that a lot. Like when my brain falls asleep or something, and the next thing I know, I've missed something. As if a puzzle piece fell out of the universe and left me staring at the blank place behind it. The school counselor told me that this was part of my ADHD. My brain misinterpreting things. I wasn't so sure. I went after Mrs. Dodds. Halfway up the steps, I glanced back at Grover. He was looking pale, cutting his eyes between me and Mr. Bruner, like he wanted Mr. Bruner to notice what was going on, but Mr. Bruner was absorbed in his novel. I looked back up. Mrs. Dodds had disappeared again. She was now inside the building at the entrance of the hall. Okay, I thought. She's going to make me buy a new shirt for Nancy at the gift shop. That's what this is. But apparently that wasn't the plan. I followed her deeper into the museum. When I finally caught up to her, we were back in the Greek and Roman section. Except for us, it was all the way empty. Mrs. Dodd stood with her arms crossed in front of a big marble frieze of, gar of the Greek gods. She was making this weird noise in her throat, like growling. Even without that noise, I would have been nervous. It's weird being alone with a teacher, especially Mrs. Dodd's. But something about the way she looked at that frieze, as if she wanted to pulverize it. You've been giving us some problems, honey, she said. I did the safe thing. I said, yes, ma'am. She tugged on the cuffs of her leather jacket. Did you really think you would get away with it? I looked in her eyes. The look in her eyes was beyond mad. This look was evil. She's a teacher, I thought nervously. It's not like she's going to hurt me. I said, I, uh, I'll try harder, ma'am. Thunder shook the building. We are not fools, Percy Jackson, Mrs. Dodd said. It was only a matter of time before we found you out. Confess and you will suffer less pain. I didn't know what she was even talking about. All I could think of was that the teachers must have found the illegal stash of candy I'd been selling out of my dorm room. Or maybe they'd realized that I got my essay about Tom Sawyer from the internet without ever reading the book, and now they were going to make me go take away my grade or something. Or worse, they were going to make me actually read the book. Well, she demanded. Um, ma'am, I don't... Your time is up, she hissed. Okay, then the weirdest thing happened. Her eyes began to glow like barbecue coals. Her fingers stretched, turning into talons. Her jacket melted, her jacket melted into large, leathery wings. She wasn't human. She was a shriveled hag with bat wings and claws and a mouth full of yellow fangs, and she was about to slice me to ribbons. And then things got even stranger. Mr. Bruner, who'd been out in front of the museum a minute before, wheeled his chair into the doorway of the gallery, holding a pen in his hand. What ho, Percy, he shouted, and tossed the pen through the air. Mrs. Dodds lunged at me. I dodged and felt her talons slash the air next to my ear. 
I snatched the ballpoint pen out of the air, but when it hit my hand, it wasn't even a pen anymore. It was a sword. Mr. Bruner's bronze sword, which he always used to use on tournament day. Mrs. Dodd spun toward me with a murderous look in her eyes. My knees were jelly. My hands were shaking so bad I almost dropped the sword. She snarled, Die, honey! And she flew straight at me. Absolute terror ran through my body. I did the only thing that came naturally. I swung the sword. The metal blade hit her shoulder and passed clean through her body as if she was made of water. Hiss! Mrs. Dodds was a sandcastle in a power fan. She exploded into yellow powder, vaporized on the spot, leaving nothing but the smell of sulfur and a dying screech and a chill of evil in the air, as if those two glowing red eyes were still watching me. I was alone. There was a ballpoint pen in my hand. Mr. Bruner wasn't there. Nobody was there but me. My hands were still trembling. My lunch must have been contaminated with magic mushrooms or something. Had I imagined that whole thing? I went back outside. It had started to rain. Grover was sitting by the fountain a museum map tented over his head. Nancy Bulbafit was still standing there, soaked from her swim in the fountain, grumbling to her ugly friends. When she saw me, she said, I hope Mrs. Kerr whipped your butt. I said, Who? Our teacher, duh. I blinked. We had no teacher named Mrs. Kerr. I asked Nancy what she was talking about. She just rolled her eyes and turned away. I asked Grover who, where Mrs. Dodds was. He said, Who? But he paused first, and he wouldn't look at me. So I thought he was messing with me. Dude's not funny, man, I said. This is serious. Thunder boomed overhead. I saw Mr. Bruner sitting under his red umbrella, reading his book, as if he'd never even moved. I went over to him. He looked up, a little distracted. Ah, that would be my pen. Please bring your own writing utensil in the future, Mr. Jackson. I had in Mr. Bruner his pen. I hadn't even realized I was still holding on to it. Sir, I said, where's Mrs. Dodds? He stared at me blankly. Who? The other chaperone. Mrs. Dodds, the pre-algebra teacher. He frowned and sat forward, looking mildly concerned. Percy, there is no Mrs. Dodds on this trip. As far as I know, there has never been a Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy. Are you sure you're feeling all right? End of chapter one.